Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Perspective. We'll be talking about the overall by-elections right now. Uh, the official results are not in. What is the overall trend? What can we expect overall as far as these by-elections are concerned? Of course, the process of by-elections also. And the fact that, of course, multiple candidature on multiple seats necessitates then by-elections on all of those seats. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about, uh, of course, this and its own effects as far as the electoral laws are concerned, as far as the overall uh, machinery, as far as election commission related uh, to that and the process when it has to be uh, invariably done again on those seats where uh, there is uh, multiple candidature. All of that today. Um, on perspective, a little later on, we'll also be talking about the raw, recent revelations by raw. Uh, and uh, behind, uh, of course, we've seen the intelligence, uh, Indian intelligence and, of course, its workings and the way that they continue, uh, you know, the their Indian government's admission itself and the fact that it, it categorically shows that there is invariable interference, there is invariable terrorism that does view from that side of the border. Uh, the in interference that is uh, now become an invariable reality in the light of these re revelations. All of that today uh, on Perspective. I have with me Naveed Aman, who is a political analyst. Thank you so much for being with us today. We also have with us Saif Tamshed Bariyar, who is a senior analyst. Thank you for joining us. And we have with us uh, Javed Jadoon, who is a political analyst. Thank you for being with us today. Naveed Sab, uh, these by-elections, before we talk about the fact that, of course, like you were earlier saying that there is this multiple candidature on multiple seats and, of course, that then invari invariably uh, results in the by-elections that happen. But other circumstances also happen, uh, like, for example, you know, if unfortunate demise of, of uh, a particular candidate and all of that. But how do you look at these by-elections? Of course, generally, there is a trend um, that we see as far as the PML and leading is concerned. But how do you look at this, uh, these multiple seats and their own uh, effect as far as these by-elections are concerned? Maruk, uh, the uh, trend is okay. Yes. Uh, whenever there is any party in uh, federal government or in uh, any provincial government, hmm. uh, normally the trend of the masses goes in favor of that government because they know that uh, this government will remain for five years and if we uh, hmm. elect our uh, um, relevant uh, candidate, hmm. uh, maybe the candidate is helpful to uh, to resolve their issues. Hmm. Number one. Number two is uh, I never uh, um, support this idea of hmm. going for uh, by-elections. Okay. Uh, most of the uh, by-elections are held because uh, the seats are uh, vacated hmm. uh, uh, um, of those uh, candidates who win the elections hmm. on uh, uh, different uh, constituencies. Hmm. They uh, hold one uh, constituency and then uh, leave all others. Uh, I mean, uh, it should not be encouraged and allowed. <coughs> the, uh, uh, in the parliament, hmm. there should be some, uh, I mean, uh, amendment, uh, amendment uh, as to uh, this, of course. regarding all these uh, multiple seats. Hmm. Uh, no candidate should be allowed to contest election on more than two seats or even one seat is enough if you want to test yourself in in the political arena one seat is enough if you win it's okay it, if you lose it uh, I mean it, it shows that you're not as popular as uh, uh, you think so uh, when the by-elections are held and the, um, uh, the entire setup of the country election mm. commission or everything is involved once again mm. and billions of rupees are you know mm. wasted for the by-elections mm. uh, I mean it makes no sense <coughs> because you know me, when when it it happens you know the the whole of the system of the country uh, uh, it stands yes. stand still let me let me include Seth in this also. Seth, there is, you know, of course, right now we are looking at, for example, uh, there are NA one one nine, which was uh, uh, the Chief Minister Mariam Nawaz uh, seat, which has been vacated. There's also Shabazz Sharif Sahib's three seats overall, but. Of course, there's been a trend by the former Prime Minister Imran Khan Sahib. At one time, he said that he would contest, and I think by twi on twenty seats. Overall, this, like Naveed Sahib is saying, is something that puts a lot of pressure on the system because invariably your funds, your whole, and then on the flip side, one argues that there is the election commission and that is what it is empowered to do. 
So, you know, um, how, how do you look at these two? How, how would you say, uh, you know, which side of the argument would you look at as far as these seats are concerned? <coughs> I think, Maruka, thank you for having me on the show today. It's always wonder wonderful to be here. I'd absolutely second with uh, what Naveed Saab said. Mm. Now, uh, the elections in, in other countries, in, in refined democracies, are a routine process. The mm. offices are on, people are at their business, people are at their jobs, the economy is not at halt, children mm. go to the school, and everything runs as a normal uh, functionality right. of, of that particular district. Mm. But unfortunately, when it comes to elections in Pakistan, we do see that there are internet bans, we do see section 144 being imposed, mm. and, and that is the need of the time. If someone says that we shouldn't be uh, imposing section 144, mm. then I think mm. uh, it mm. would ultimately lead to a very chaotic situation given the it political is yeah, it is given the political polarity that it exists. Right Even today, as far as my information and my resources mm. tell me, mm. there have been certain instances in uh, Talagang, uh, Chakwal Kam Talagang, mm. where uh, uh, they, there was an apparent uh, way in which a clash was emerging. But ultimately, because uh, the mobile phones were not functional, because mm. people did not have access to misinformation, Mm. how misinformation has taken over the political scatter of Pakistan, True. being more detrimental than mm. incremental. Mm. Mm. I think uh, the demand of the time is that, yes, we are bounded by a process where we do not have parliamentary amendments to stop uh, such by-elections from happening. I mm. think this time the government actually needs to bring in a parliamentary amendment that a person who's standing on the National Assembly seat, I'll take an example of Sardar Saab. Sardar Ghulam Abbas mm. was the uh, candidate for the, for the provincial assembly seat. He won that seat. He won okay. the MA seat. I think... Uh, there is no logic in a person giving in nomination papers for a PP seat and giving in nomination papers for a NA seat. This mm. literally overburdens and shatters uh, the, the confidence of the entire political system, number it one. It could also then, you and know... And the economic costs. Economic cost also, and I want to include uh, Javed Saab in this. Javed Saab, it would also mean that political parties would then, you know, have to necessarily get their house in order and you know get their whole uh, you know they they would have to know who's doing what in terms of you know if if you want a candidate to be on a punjab assembly seat then you would know who's you know as far as who's going to be your chief minister overall your makeup uh, would be there that homework would have to be there and those decisions would not uh, you know come in last minute right yeah, I think uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hall. Uh, uh, part of the problem with Pakistan's uh, electoral and the political system is that uh, political parties don't go to the electorate on the basis of their political ideology and their manifestos, etc. Uh, basically, when you uh, have a politics which is based on brotherism and which is based on parochialism and uh, narrow uh, regionalism as well, then you don't see democracy moving forward the way the Western uh, democracies have moved uh, because people now they uh, the political parties do politics on the basis of issues. Even in America, uh, for, for us maybe it's a very small issue, the healthcare. It becomes one of the most uh, important driving forces as far as uh, election campaigns are concerned. Political parties uh, they press their own points and uh, they try and convince the electorate that uh, this is what you would like to do for you, but not happening in Pakistan. What is the agenda of uh, these uh, uh, by-elections in Pakistan in such a large number? Have you heard any uh, political party talking about their manifestos? 90 days, 100 days, the government is in power at the federal level, and there are four provincial governments at, in, in Kabul Pakhtunkhwa, in Punjab, in Balochistan, in uh, Sindh. Look, what kind of a, 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 a political uh, 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 yardsticks they have given as far as the performance is concerned. Have they talked about 90 days or 100 days agenda? Have they been able to uh, move forward on those agendas? No, I don't uh, believe so. Because I think at the end of the day, it becomes a, an exercise of stability. Javed, so I'm going to inter interject for, you know, as far as the agenda generally is concerned, there is, you know, by and large, the focus at this time continues to be economy. There's, of course, terrorism. We know the priorities, uh, you know, as far as the government is concerned. We see from, from time to time action being taken, for example, you know, on uh, issues like uh, wheat, on the issue issues like roti, naan, you know, all of that. And I know that provinces are doing this separately. But overall, you know, at this time, the priority is economy. Isn't that true? Absolutely. Economy is uh, the uh, most important issue in Pakistan. Rather, it is the most gravest challenge in Pakistan. 
when IMF predicted uh, the uh, the growth rate at 8.1 per, uh, 8.1 per 8% in the uh, the current financial year, and then inflation is going to stay around 25%. Uh, 40% population is below poverty line. More than one crore people are going to fall below poverty line. This is the apprehension. This is what uh, UNDP says. And uh, how many how many kids are out of school? Do you know that? How many kids are stunted and so there's a malnutrition? Aren't, they issue, aren't these issues for the political parties? I mean, even uh, you talk about the main uh, mainstream political parties, they have not, not a single party has mentioned these very important, very existential issues as far as Pakistan's uh, future is concerned. When you have a population which is more than 60% young population in Pakistan, what is the roadmap as far as uh, the young people are concerned? Are they going to create jobs and how many jobs they are going to create? And look at uh, the, the dismal uh, uh, landscape as far as the private sector is concerned. Because government alone is not the uh, biggest job provider in every uh, advanced uh, democratic and uh, industrialized society. It is the private sector which does that. In our neighboring country, the biggest employer is the private sector. Uh, and uh, in, in Pakistan, because of the skyrocketing uh, prices, of uh, electricity, gas, and petrol, and uh, I understand there must be reasons for doing that. But at the end of the day, what you do is you uh, spike up uh, the cost of doing business, and then you are not any more uh, competitive. So uh, the businesses are down. Most of uh, about 50% industry has been shut down. Remittances are going down. Exports are very dismal. Pakistan is well, Javed sir, I, I don't want to. I, I I want to come back to. I'm going to go to Naveed sir. I think the situation isn't as dismal now as it was perhaps you know a few months ago. In the in the sense that we've seen a pickup as far as overall the trends that are that are that we're looking at. We're looking at a pickup as far as the stock exchange is concerned. We are looking at of course next month the IMF team coming and that the Saudi, uh, investment. The Saudi investment of course also is is something that the government has Qatar, really Saudi really worked on and there is there. They're expected to be tangible results there very soon. So, uh, but to put things back in order or to put things back into you know that kind of drive is going to take some time. It will, hmm. but uh, you know the government will have to hmm. take some uh, I mean, affirmative uh, measures. Like hmm. you know, if you want to increase uh, the income of a common man, uh, you will not have to reduce the price of roti only. Roti hmm. is very important for every common man, hmm. but you know, uh, you will have to reduce the uh, tariff rate of hmm. uh, uh, electricity, the, the gas, the hmm. petrol. Uh, in, in gas bills, hmm. the six slabs are di di given. Hmm. Uh, the, the, the first slab is uh, around 272 rupees. Hmm. Uh, when you increase a few uh, units, you go at uh, 1257. And then you go for uh, 4,570, and then 9,125, nine hmm. 18,227, and 18,290 hmm. per you know um, uh, improvement in the units. Hmm. Uh, gas is very important for every you know uh, commercial or uh, domestic use, hmm. but it doesn't mean that you use gas uh, uh, um, uh, at t t 10 points and you give 272 rupees per unit. You're saying uh, that there needs to be a change? In no, the no, no, it should be uniform. Should the be next uniform. Uh, units should also be on the uniform. Like right. if you go take petrol for mm -hmm. one liter mm -hmm. and you t give uh, 300 rupees for it mm -hmm. and for uh, two liters you will give 600. You will not give 700 or mm -hmm. 800. Mm -hmm. So it should be uniform. Right. Uh, it If you go for it, you will improve the economy of a common man and mm. if the economy of a common man improves the country always uh, already goes up uh, right. in, a, in a you know very comfortable that's zone that's true and i think that as far as the government is concerned they the target is of course to improve economy because you know they so want the to perform bills should be you know reduced and uh, of course that's that's where their focus is but self also you were earlier mentioning uh, you know as far as uh, when you suspend your uh, you know internet services and we've seen that happening in areas in the by elections i want to talk a little bit about that also as far as the election process is concerned we are even now looking at allegations of there being rigging which are coming from the opposition this is not necessarily the right brand of politics again we've spoken about this before also but you know by elections of course the government does have a little you know it shows a trend and for those voters perhaps it makes a difference and they you know generally vote for for those in government but does it necessarily mean these allegations have to come 
Uh, Maru, I think this is very unbecoming, to mm. be honest. Uh, very honestly speaking, uh, I think from a certain political party or from maybe some other political parties as well, because mm. there are two, three political parties who are in the leads for allegations mm. these days. If uh, someone bags a seat in the by-election of Pakhtunkhwa, that election is absolutely transparent. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if uh, a, a seat is being lost from Punjab, mm -hmm. then that particular election absolutely becomes a nuisance. And that becomes the talk of the town. That becomes a talk of transparency. Mm -hmm. Now, I, yeah, from the same party. I, I want to really know from this particular political party that the election commission uh, that operates in Pakhtunkhwa, is it operating from Jupiter or Mars? Mm -hmm. It is operating within the same uh, functionality or within the same uh, logistical machinery mm -hmm. of the entire election electoral process. That's number one. And number second, I think uh, suspending the internet, I do know that it is curbing freedom. I okay. absolutely understand that. Mm. But then again, I think uh, these uh, trends or these hashtags being mm. operated from somewhere else mm. and being operated against the entire state of Pakistan. They are mm. not being operated against the government of Pakistan. The government is simply a functionary of the yes. wider state. Mm. Now, these trends have done more damage mm. than, than betterment to the political process of this country. I think and the generally contribute and to the polarization. And they contribute also. to the polarization, I think, when it's about uh, the fragility mm. of economic, not only, but it's about the physical fragility in which we're hanging in right now. Mm. I'll be talking certainly in the later segment about that as well. Mm. But look at how fragile things are that candidates who are uh, filing in nominations for MNAs and MPAs, their cars are being blown up in Pakhtunkhwa or adjoining areas. Mm. So I think in such circumstances, the security of the voter is the responsibility of the state. It is and what takes precedence absolutely. overall, you know, for the and, state and, 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 and for them to one, prioritize. One last what's comment important. over here would be that, all right, these things can absolutely be, uh, you know, observed from uh, Pakistan, uh, Tariq and Saf now being merged into the SIC. Mm. But I think sensible political stalwarts like Mulana Fazur Rahman, sensible, political, mature people like Mahmood Khan Achik Zai, mm. I think they need to exercise some political, you know, wisdom above and beyond or apart from what SIC-backed candidates are doing right now. But are we, are we looking at that kind of, uh, let me, let me go to Javed Saab. Javed Saab, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Javed Saab, are we, are we, you know, on the one hand, what Saif is saying is, of course, making sense. But do you think that there is, you know, that trend in politics where, we are looking at that kind of caution, that kind of uh, perhaps, you know, that better sense should prevail. Do you expect that to be the case anytime soon at all? Well, I don't expect any kind of a better sense as far as Pakistan's uh, top tier political leadership is concerned, be that uh, Pakistan Muslim and Pakistan Tarikin Saf, uh, Pakistan People's Party, or whatever, whatever we are talking about. At what particular stage they have shown the maturity? At what particular point in time they have told the people that we can resolve our issues on the negotiating table? At what political uh, a particular point in time they have uh, conveyed the message to the people of Pakistan that we have learned uh, from our past mistakes and we are not going to repeat the same old mistakes. We might uh, make different mistakes in a different way. Uh, you know, the problem with Pakistan's political paradigm is that it is kind of a vicious cycle. We keep moving uh, on this, uh, in this particular vicious cycle. We keep on harping. One party which comes into power, the other political party alleges that elections have been stolen. And when the same political party it goes into a position, they start uh, labeling the same kind of allegations that elections have been stolen. I don't see any uh, general elections where... Uh, one or the other political party or the group of political parties, they allege that elections are stolen. And now, what, what is the problem? Where is the problem? How can you resolve it? Political maturity requires that you discuss these very important and very sensitive issues on the floor of the House. You talk about the way forward. You discuss what kind of a modalities you want to decide where uh, every political party should accept the outcome of the elections. They haven't shown that kind of a maturity. It is it is unending a cycle of uh, allegations and counter allegations where we don't accept the results. Now look what is happening right now in front of me. I have seen a couple of uh, television screens that uh, PTI is winning in KP and the uh, New League is winning in Punjab and Pakistan People's Party is winning in Sin and so on and so forth. So let us be uh, uh, pragmatic. Uh, whatever results people throw uh, as far as elections are concerned, all political parties should accept the results once for all. They show the maturity. 
they must tell the people that well we accept the verdict of the people maybe to, today we are in a position tomorrow we might be in a position to come back in power as well maybe at the federal level at the provincial level but i don't see baro happening even in in future as well unless and until uh, there is a, a, there is some kind of a dialogue between every uh, major political party they must at least on one or two agenda items they must agree that well uh, we will uh, Uh, make it sure that elections are held uh, in a in a transparent fair and free manner and then the results come we will accept that we will come right. see we will tell fair the enough. Not, fair not. enough thank you so much javed sir thank you for your very valuable time uh, we're going to move on and talk about the revelations as far as roy is concerned we have seen that indian government submission rajnath singh um, and the fact that you know the public confirmation admission of the existence of indian dead squads operating on foreign soil particularly in pakistan uh, we're going to be talking about that also the guardian newspaper report which clearly uh, has published a report um, alleging india's uh, orchestration of uh, of course extrajudicial killings in pakistan uh all of that today uh, now in the remaining part of the program and uh, we have with us dr tokrul yameen uh dr tokrul can you hear me no so there there's a problem with audio i'm going to go to navid saab uh, navid saab there is uh, you know again these uh, this is a categorical admission it's also you know indicates the way that you know this policy of extrajudicial mur- murder as far as the indian state is concerned as far as pakistan is concerned we've also responded strongly we've also said that you know india's assertion of uh, preparedness for these extrajudicial executions which they are talking about is an admission of culpability yes it is an admission of culpability but how and where do we go from here in your opinion maruk uh, mm. in the entire world india mm. has started this way of uh, you know crime and terrorism mm. and target killing and pakistan is the Um, the um, the first country who is the worst hit uh, by indian terrorism and mm. indian target killing mm. and uh, 20 uh, pakistanis have been killed so far mm. uh, and targeted by india uh first um, before all this situation india has been doing all this but now you know india has uh, uh, admitted it mm. i mean it is one step ahead of it on its behavior mm. uh it can never be appreciated and pakistan will have to raise uh, its voice on uh, in the uh, united nations and on uh, every but for us i want to talk about this i'll include saif in this uh, first i'll go to dr togul if he can hear me now ji dr togul can you hear me now yes i can hear you ji dr togul there is you know we talk about and i think navid saab is 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 uh, also mentioning this we talk about bringing this forward we talk about making you know this becoming in making of course and rightfully so this should become this is our reasonable demand that there should be of course uh, cu- there is culpability here as far as india is concerned where there is so much admission we've seen there is proof kulbushan yadav was one case in point we've also seen this these numerous reports that have come forward we've also seen uh, their own admission as far as uh, you know uh, this uh, involvement is concerned and to an extent now um i think you will agree with me we've seen this extend to other parts of the world also and those voices being raised do you think it it is about a balance right how does the world balance what india offers to them in terms of their economic gain where priorities and self interests remain and where you know rightfully calling out india and will they in your opinion be able to you know balance that to call what is right right and what is wrong wrong uh well it's a very unfair place uh, look what is happening in gaza people are killing the uh, uh, palestinians uh, without any remorse the israelis and the world uh, sits by uh, watching all these uh, atrocities taking place and does nothing about it so i don't think the world will uh, actually censor uh indians for what they are doing they have gone into canada they have killed uh, uh a canadian sikh they have gone to the united states of america they have tried to kill a sikh activist over there as well so uh, the world is very much aware but the world will not do anything about it because as you yourself mentioned that uh, india is a good market for them and 
if people kill like get killed so be it and uh, pakistanis uh, pakistani lives really doesn't matter muslim lives doesn't uh, don't matter But dr togel it's not it's not just pakistani lives at this time right it's, it's other countries now we've seen the the canadians also raise an issue on this we've also seen the the, the americans you know their uh, uh, department of justice if, uh, correct me if i'm wrong also talk about this and say that you know there is now india's uh you know involvement in other countries is becoming more blatant it's becoming more you know they're getting braver um and and i don't know if brave is the right word for it no, or not but they are you know now becoming uh, uh completely uh you know they, they, it, it doesn't matter what country where wherever they feel uh they they do interfere we've seen you know justin trudeau also talk about this and it's not just pakistan so where does the buck stop in this case and will it stop because uh, you know then for the world it, it, there is a time for reflection and they need to reflect whether it is going to be you know it, it's time now to call out india or not and there's only really one country that can do that right which country do you have in mind the united states of america United States of America doesn't care to who or what the Indians are doing against Pakistan, or uh, one odd Sikh uh, activist in New York doesn't matter. A person in Canada doesn't doesn't matter. Uh, people are not bothered about uh, uh, countries like India or countries like Israel. There are double standards in the world. Uh, when will we understand that nobody cares about uh, uh, the underdogs? Uh, when a world power, where world power is uh, concerned. uh today i read that uh, the uh, uh department uh, of state in the united states of america are, are going to call 14 country the ambassadors of 14 countries who have uh, supported the palestinian membership in the united nations so uh, there are there is a clear disconnect of what we consider as the moral higher ground or uh, morality or humanity that doesn't exist in this world uh, uh, uh Pakistanis might get killed, or the Palestinian might get killed, or Rohingyas might get killed, or or, or other people in the world, might, oppressed people might get killed in the world. Nobody is bothered. And India, I, what did uh, what did the what did Justin Trudeau do except for talking in the parliament that uh, he is very perturbed about it? Were there any sanctions? Who did they cut call off relations? Call me naive, yes, Doctor Tokhar. Call me naive, but I'm going to include Saif in this discussion also. But I think that. Saif, isn't it? You know the optics of what India is doing. <clears throat> okay, I agree with Dr. Togril that it's India. I agree that America is America. I agree that the underdog is an underdog. I agree that you know what's happening in Palestine is before all of us. What Israel is doing, but the question is, in a changing world where you know we've we've seen the ban as far as Israel and Palestine is concerned, you know, didn't work at till a certain point where even your mainstream media. had to show the real picture because of what was happening on social media the, the outcry is immense i'm not saying that it's made a, a huge difference but even a 0.1% difference in you know perhaps a calculated change in the kind of statements that have come forward by other leaders does it not show that the optics do matter today <clears throat> maruk absolutely the optics matter when hmm. it's about international security when it's about regional and even national security hmm. i'll uh, talk about pakistan in particular at the moment i'll hmm. tell you this very dirty game that raw and in india are playing hmm. right now hmm. they're absolutely playing a part of blood maruk hmm. and hmm. and this part of blood will have uh, dire consequences if they do not correct their direction hmm. you know maruk uh, they are politically targeting people and mm. they are economically targeting people as well today mm. i want to take the platform of the national television to speak up for all the jawans and the officers of the pakistan custom service and the frontier constabulary in particular the most underrated services who mm. are economically investing in collecting funds for this country right mm. now and frontier constabulary giving every district in balochistan and pakhtunkhwa as well security as well mm. seven uh, pakistan customs officers and uh, uh, jawans have been killed uh, in 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 the last two days maruk this really calls for us to reconsider that is this not economic targeting in terms of you know hitting people economically if you look at 
the very areas of conflict they are mm -hmm. balochistan and their pakhtunkhwa this mm -hmm. is the entire route that cpac really has at the moment yeah. and today the game that roy is playing the mm -hmm. bar of blood that roy is playing they are not even politically targeting now they are economically operating as hitmen in the world and i think today we as as a country need to be raising our voices that what about the security of all these intellectually calibrated civil servants of this country what about the security of all the teachers who are operating in schools of pakhtunkhwa and schools of balochistan mm -hmm. what about the security of all these jawans who are endlessly battling uh, a war that is made with waged by the research and the analysis wing now if they want to battle us battle mm -hmm. us in economy battle us in poverty battle us wh when it comes to human development indices but they but they say that they are they've already gone ballistic succeeding as they've as absolutely as gone ballistic if if a person like narendra modi the butcher of B gujarat can go as far as arresting a two time sitting chief minister of the capital mm -hmm. then you, you can understand mm -hmm. his war mongering abilities to be economically hitting us where we we take the hit the but most but we are also unfortunately um, javed uh, i'm going to include navid saab in this also but we are also you know unfortunately looking at an india that continues to support that butcher of gujarat as you said it continues to support the extremist tendencies of the indian modi led government it continues to support the suppression of minorities in india so it's it's not that you know things are changing in that regard so i agree with dr tokrul as far as that is concerned but the question is that is it going to stop and how will it stop maruk uh, modi is very successful in you know uh, in his uh, diplomacy and mm. politics and mm. uh, in making the things understand that this country is for the hindus this is hindustan this is not india this is not for the minorities this is for in, uh, hi indian hindus mm. and uh, he says that every minority needs to quit india mm. so uh, he shows that uh, this country is very safe for the hindus and it should be good country for the hindus only this idea but, and but this Navita, approach and this myth true? I, i mean isn't it true that the voices of reason within india even those uh, that earlier maybe supported modi are now talking about what is happening those that have the foresight to see where we where india is going with this even within india we talk about polarization in our country you know as far as political polarization is concerned and you know that is a different kind of polarization altogether what we are looking at india the you way that it is being fragmented the way that it is you know suppressing minorities the way that you know inhuman treatment is being meted out the spill over of kashmir also uh, maruk more than 900 uh, million indians uh, are going to vote for uh, this election yeah uh, these maximum of these voters are hindus hmm. and modi believes that if only the hindus vote for him he will be successful so he is very successful targeting in, uh, that yes, vote bank targeting that you know vote bank and is very successful in making them understand that um, we uh, i am the candidate and i will be the one who will take care of yourself uh, you take care of yourself in the country for this he believes that uh, if he targets the neighboring country like pakistan hmm. in terrorism in uh, target killing it doesn't uh, matter I mean, you know, whether he, it's he, pakistan he pleases, or kashmir pleases, or any other country for him it's about political gain yes we understand that but is it as bleak as dr togrel says dr togrel you know as do we not i mean you know agitating on every front as far as you know our rightful position at this time talking about what uh, you know is happening as far as india is concerned we of course we have dossiers also and un uh, but you think that these bodies are largely ineffectual then we've seen the ineffectiveness of course as far as uh, palestine uh, is concerned to a certain extent which bodies are you talking about the united nations organization the imf the world bank you see these are these are dominated by rich countries in the un all of us know that it is the five uh, we took uh, holding powers that uh, call the shots they also fund uh, the united nations pakistan is only pays a very very minimum amount uh, for the running of the united nations so to expect that the united nations is going to listen to you is uh, unreasonable what i am trying to say is that there is very little scope of your voice making any dent in the indian policy or the world policy uh, or the international policies of the united states or or canada or for that matter many other countries yeah, china will support to you to an extent but uh, this is basically 
uh, our problem we got to guard our own people the, con the constitution of pakistan says that the, the uh, uh, security of the life and limb of the citizens of pakistan is the responsibility of the government of pakistan and the state is not shying away from its responsibilities um, you know like uh, saif no, no, just no, no, said no, our jawan of course and our jawans are are you know our armed forces overall our security forces their sacrifices are uh, you know no, right in front no, no, of no, us no, no, that's not that's not that's not the point what i'm trying to say is that it is our responsibility expect, expecting the un or the united states or the or the canadian government to protect our citizens is i think is uh, absurd we got but to protect our own people but dr tokrel they should be protecting their own people they should be protecting their own citizens and there is of course you know in there is clear cut interference in canadian for example uh, you know um, in canada also so so it's not just i'm saying that it shows a trend now there is a there is a kind of brazenness you know i think to use that word uh, as far as the india now is concerned the admissions prove it the guardian newspaper report proves it this this policy of extra judicial murder that is being exercised it's now you know it seems like they have gone too far and their are repercussions are they not for the world because we are all nuclear states as far as our geo um, you know geo strategic position is concerned it does give us some clout does it not are you going to press your nuclear button if 20 people if 20 of your people are killed you are not going to do that you see the israelis do it with impunity they also go into other countries and assassinate political assassinations have taken place in israel the cia tried to kill uh, fidel castro a number of times they failed but there is nothing new in what is happening and it is for a poor country or a smaller country like ourselves to have our guards up expecting the others to come and help you you may raise a din uh, uh, raise a lot of noise about uh, killings taking place in your country nobody listens to you as you mentioned yourself mentioned dossiers have been uh, given to uh, these countries even india has been given dossiers but they don't uh, have they listened have they reciprocated hello self wants to respond I'd, to this i I'd, i'd like to add a little on to it hmm. uh, when we say that the united nations we cannot really expect the uno to interfere what hmm. is the uno uno is the international government of the world that hmm. is the literal meaning of the united nations organization hmm. that was established after the league of nations failed yeah. why does the un exist in the world the un exists to ensure that the collective conscious of the world remains the collective hmm. political and economic security of the world does not dismantle it exists to protect the rights and the lives of every in the world whether they are in africa in asia in europe or in latin america mm. the united nations has a direct responsibility if my prime minister if my former prime minister even went to the un and informed the world in the mm. general assembly of the mm. catastrophe of war mm. of war if my permanent representative to the un is crying out every day that balochistan is a bard of blood that india is trying to infiltrate into i think it is the collective global voice that needs to answer if 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 we say that you know united nations has nothing to do with it i think let's dismantle it what's the, think, what's the point of that but i think to be fair what dr tohril is saying is that they have you know bodies like the united nations are largely have proved a certain level of ineffectiveness because either, either we need to i mean uh, um, uh, ch change the, the the system of united because, nations because the veto also has yes. shown that you know clearly um, the the rules need to change for there to be some you know responsibility the un has proved itself that it is uh, an if uh, ineffective uh, forum mm. so the ineffectiveness of the forum has created problem for the entire world mm. it will have to be effective or either or we will have to or the entire world will have to I mean form any other forum to uh, make the things um, more effective Dr Tokrel is that I mean I know I know your your stance and I think you know to a certain extent of course one has to contend that it is a realistic one but do you think that the recent events have exposed the UN its ineffectualness in a manner that may necessitate a change as far as its uh, rules are concerned because you know the world is <laughs> question yeah, I can see Dr Tokrel doesn't agree with me You 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 got to read the uh, read the UN Charter. It is it does not say it is meant to protect the citizens of the world. It is meant to prevent 
wars taking place in this world and they have meant to uh, resolve conflicts they have not been able to do but dr togrel isn't palestine and israel a war isn't it a genocide isn't it a isn't it a, a you know conflict as you said no no listen to me they have not been able to prevent conflicts they have not been able to resolve uh, conflicts like kashmir they have not been in, uh, able to resolve conflicts like palestine but protecting people citizens is not their responsibility they have not been able to do so they have been ineffective to a certain uh, degree but yet you want to be a member of the united nations you want to leave it you don't want to leave it because you want to remain part of the uh, world at large you <laughs> so the point is that united nations is a body which is influenced by five powers victorious powers of the second world war they have veto powers and then united nations does not have any uh, mechanisms to enforce its will it is a world body all right with a, with a headquarter in, the, in 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 new york but it cannot enforce its writ if the only uh, decisions that are binding on nations are those which are passed in the security council even that cannot be enforced because united nations does not have any mechanism uh, a standing army or a standing standing police force even what the icj says is not implementable so you must understand the limits of the united nations organization and it is only if the world at large agrees to a certain thing and it is uh, willing to raise a force uh, protect protection force to uh, for people in in palestine or uh, other places uh, and that too depends on the other country the host government ex- ex- expecting uh, accepting this force to come in and protect you but would pakistan be allowing an international police force to come into their country to stop uh, the indian uh, uh, columnist or the uh, no it won't uh, i agree with you it won't but i think maybe my uh, point of view is perhaps a, a rather naive one but i think that because of the accessibility uh, to the right of information because of uh you know that that accessibility that uh, that invariably you know will allow information even when it is curtailed to trickle down you know we've seen that happen as far as palestine is concerned because of that the optics are important and because the optics are so important now it's going to need the world powers to react if not in a befitting manner in a somewhat befitting manner to the injustices of the world and that may be a point of view that you know you don't uh, subscribe to and it may not be a correct one but i think that you know the 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 kind of outcry we've seen i'm not saying that you know you've seen a difference as far as for example g people have been killed in gaza alone maruk has that made any difference are we listening to it are we paying heed to it children are being killed uh, women folk are being killed uh, uh, journalists are being killed is the world listening to you the world is not listening to you because you are not uh, you see even muslim countries are apathetic they are not doing anything uh, for the the genocide that is taking place in palestine so again coming back to my own country 20 people killed yes bad news bad show but do we have the power to stop this kind of activity that is what should we should be uh, focusing on we should have our defenses up we should our intelligence agencies should be working harder to get uh, early warning uh, about uh, any infiltrators these people should be killed before they kill our people expecting the world to come to your help this is not going to happen that's what i'm trying to say it has to come to to the help not i mean i i feel that we are Uh, it's know. all about invoking the world's collective conscious that is it it's a world of political dialogue not I missiles and bombs i think that's put it better so so can we invoke that conscious you think it's possible you think, think there's a thawing there's a little bit different maruk we are invoking that conscious okay. today i've never seen people in europe come out for palestine like they do i've I, never I seen agree. people in north america come out like that i've never seen people in japan come out like that it's I a war it's a war of political narratives of the right and the long and the left and the right it's it's not a it's not a war of missiles and bombs and literally russia and uh, china can play more vital role yes. in, uh, in one statement one, one statement one statement by vladimir putin after iran's uh, uh, you know defensive strategy and that has you know brought 
things to a considerable thaw in the Middle East. I agree. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. Thank you so much for being with us, Nabi Daman sahab. Thank you for joining us, Javed Jadun sahab. Thank you for being with us, Saif Timshed Bariyar. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Tughal Yameen. Thank you for being with us today. Overall, of course, uh, you know, one hopes, I would say at the end, that there is a thawing. One hopes that there is because of the accessibility of information, there will be some change in the world politics and the way that the world powers look at political gain. And perhaps we will see changes where they need to be made for those that need help when we look at what's happening in Palestine, when we look at the overall outcry that we've seen all over the world as far as uh, the killings of the Palestinians are concerned. But also, more relevantly to what's happening as far as Pakistan, India is concerned, India's activities, its brazenness, its acknowledgement of their uh, uh, interference in other countries will necessitate some sort of collective action at one point or another. Thank you so much for joining us today on Perspective.